uh, I'm gonna skip about I'm gonna skip the part in which we present the company and so on and so forth. But uh, yeah, basically, I want to talk about how uh, we can use KVM in our um, smart contract tooling, what the current availability of the smart contract tooling is, and uh, I'm gonna start with some very basic stuff and go from the ground up. So uh, first of all, I'm gonna talk about the uh, process of writing a smart contract. So one of the most used uh, high-level languages in which developers develop smart contracts is the Solidity language. And basically using the Solidity compiler, uh, we generate the application binary interface or the ABI and then the EVM bytecode, which is actually the low-level code which is executed by every node in the blockchain and gets stored on the blockchain. So uh, I'm gonna get a uh, I'm gonna come back to this slide a little bit later. So uh, next, I want to talk a bit about the available tooling. So as I answered the question before, if someone wants to develop a smart contract project locally, they would uh, first have to access one of these tools, which I assume there are more, but these are one of the most ad adopted in the space. So uh, these are. Uh, toolkits for developers which uh, provide a local instance of the EVM to act as a sandbox in which they can deploy their tests, run migrations, uh, and run unit tests mostly. So initially there was the Truffle suit which had a test runner and another instance of EVM written in JavaScript called Ganache or something like that. And uh, the idea is that would have their uh, Solidity smart contracts developed and um, compiled by the Solidity compiler, and then they would write their test in JavaScript and using a wrapper around uh, frameworks like Chai and uh, Mocha, they, or Mocha, they would um, execute those tests against uh, the local network. Um, but yeah, uh, after that, the hard hat appeared and uh, what it brought new to the table was the uh, a more powerful framework for testing. Um, also, Solidity uh, tests became a thing, and developers could write tests directly in Solidity without having to run um, Java, without having to write JavaScript tests. Um, but yeah, Hardhat also came with the advantage that both the local uh, instance of the VM and the test runner were in a single tool. So basically users would only have uh, one command to execute them all. And um, yeah, uh, the latest tool is Foundry, which is uh, getting more and more ground and more and more traction. Uh, Foundry brought two new uh, features to developers. They brought the cheat codes, um, which I'm going to talk about them, and they brought fuzzing to uh, the Solidity test. So basically, uh, for the tests written in Solidity, uh, the cheat codes offer a way for developers to alter the state, the state of EVM in a way they couldn't before. So basically, a cheat code is a function signature or an external function signature that does not have an implementation at the Solidity level, and um, as I said, it gives developers the ability to alter the state. Uh, basically, the interface would be inst instantiated at a concrete address, predetermined both at the Solidity level and at the VM level. And when the uh, contract would call the cheat code, basically the EVM would be uh, would have a predetermined uh, function and would know how to execute that code. Uh, and I'm gonna uh, present that shortly. So, for example, some Solidity uh, cheat codes examples are the way, the ability to start a prank and impersonate any address, uh, the ability to deal a specific balance to any address in the space, the ability to uh, specify which code is at which address and expecting reverts and these are just a few. Um, okay, and also, as I said, the uh, library or the instance has a concrete address on which everything is gonna 
every cheat code is going to be called against. And in uh, this example is some catch act of the HEVM cheat code string. So this address is kept both at the Solidity level and at the VM level. Um, and of course, we had to implement that in KVM, and I'll talk about KVM again shortly. But how we uh, process these cheat codes is basically we intercept any call which is against that hard-coded address. And uh, you would have to believe me that this sharp address of Foundry cheat is the same address as this one. Um, but yeah, once we intercept a call to that address, then we take the function signature and the function arguments from the call data, and we just gonna instantiate a new call to the foundry. Uh, and uh, we will instantiate a new rule with uh, our behavior, basically, and intercepting the call and adding our own uh, process to it. So you are adding semantics or new semantics to cheat codes, basically. Yeah, basically we extended KVM to have this capability. Capability. Okay, and where is the semantics of this thing? You, it's in that rule at the top, or it's somewhere else. So that sharp return foundry, what is that? Or sharp call foundry? What are so those things? So the sharp call foundry is a production, or uh, will have multiple rules which will match all the cheat codes. Uh, in this slide, for example, I have a sharp okay. call foundry rule in which the selector is that deal address. And for example, I say that when the selector um, is equal to the uh, deal of address and u into 56, and the selector is the function hash of a uh, function signature, basically the first four bytes from the call data. Um, when we get a call and the first four bytes match the signature of uh, this cheat code, Basically, we instead of executing the code and moving the stack trace to an external contract, we just say that, okay, load this account, uh, which is the first 32 bytes from the call data, and then set the balance um, to uh, set the balance of the address, which again is the first 32 bytes from the call data, and uh, set the balance of that address to the value, which is the next which is represented by the next 32 bytes from the call data. And we have these kind of rules for every cheat code, and we also implemented some cheat codes of our own, because for symbolic execution, we would like to have uh, ways in which we could specify, okay, I want this function to have symbolic storage from now on. I want that uh, the execution to not take the gas in account, and just from this point forward, just to have um, infinite gas, for example. What is, what is the purpose of this? Why do you do this? Basically, to integrate with something like Foundry because the UI from Foundry understands. Well, not. Or you can now develop all kinds of tools on top of the EM semantics that take advantage of this extension. Well, Foundry was the first toolkit which uh, implemented this kind of cheat codes and basically took the library from HEVM. But the idea is that we can compile. We can we work with the artifacts generated by the Solidity compiler, and we can intercept any Solidity function call which uses these cheat codes. Um, so we currently work uh, support, uh, we currently have the best integration with Foundry, but we could work with other toolkits as well. But also rely on this idea of cheat codes somehow. Yes, but these cheat codes are basically just the Solidity contract interface which they could import in their programs and projects, and then they could just use it as, uh, they could also write, they could directly write uh, Solidity function calls to have symbolic execution. I mean, that's the goal here. I mean, what would it take, for example, to do the same thing with, um, let's say, the multiple set Rust, you know, version of Rust? Can we do exactly the same thing? and? Or... Not exactly the same thing. We won't have to find a way to see how their artifact, how their contract gets co gets compiled, and uh, I'm not very familiar with their uh, VM and how it works. But uh, I'd say something like that is possible with some tweaks. Okay. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Anyone from Multiverse Six? <laughs> 
Okay, yeah. So one example of uh, foundry fast testing is um, this. Basically, I'm just having an ERC20 token and I have uh, two values, uh, two function values, which will get fast, the address and the 256 unit amount. So basically, I'm saying that I'm deploying a new ERC20 and I'm saying that at the uh, in the storage, at the um, in the balances map for the address location, uh, so the storage location in the contract would uh, ha would be the storage location, and I'm assuming that at that location I have this given amount, and then I'm invoking the ERC20 function balance of uh, of that symbolic address, or sorry, or that address which currently is fuzzed. And then I'm asserting that the balance returned by the uh, function is actually the amount which I assumed it's correct in the first place. So here the VM assume works like a precondition. And I'm just saying this is an example of a cheat code where I can insert any um, uh, line of code and assume that it's true. So basically here I'm saying that for uh, a fast address, with a fuzzed uh, balance, the balance of function should return the correct um, amount. Uh, okay. Can we use this? Can we go back? Yes. So this same basic idea principle to develop program verifiers or yes, uh, I... or different tools like you know like maybe even what uh, what uh, Julian showed right by basically extending your programming language semantics with additional things like this a sigma set three post conditions and so on and um, then basically in the semantics whenever you have assume you know just add that as a condition yeah that's what we're condition. that's what we're currently doing with kvm right but i mean it's beautiful but can we do it generally for any language Right, so basically, define in the case of Julian, define the semantics of Cairo, then add these cheat, cheat codes, <laughs> right? Assume a set, three post conditions, and then voila. And yeah, the that could be done. Yeah. yeah. Is assume also capable of changing the state, or it just lets the father explore all the state and it just uh, chops off the, so, the cases uh, where it, it doesn't match? So assume would only add. Uh, I might be wrong on this, but uh, as far as I know, the assume would only add a constraint at the bottom. Okay. So it's just constraint-based, and then the fuzzer does the job of exploring what's valid and what's well, not. I am talking about KVM, uh, about yeah. fuzzing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But about KVM, yeah, I would only it would only add a constraint at the bottom, and the prover will uh, sort mm -hmm. it out. Thanks. So basically, can do different things, right? With, uh, with this. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So. There are also some uh, um, limits. For example, I tried to run the fuzzer for 300 times, and most of the tests passed. And uh, you can see that it has 300 uh, runs. But for example, it can also uh, reject too many inputs and uh, fail to execute the test. And here I can, it says that it only ran for nine times, but it couldn't um, because it reached a hard top limit. Uh, this limit could be overwritten. Uh, but this is for the um, uh, presentation purposes. So basically, this is the test that failed. It's another case of a transfer function. I'm having uh, multiple assumes, and for the fuzzer, it's hard to find uh, input data that would match all of the assumes. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, this is a success case for the transfer in which, again, I'm assuming that the balance in the storage uh, of a given address, Alice, so I have a given address, Alice, an address, Bob, a balance of, the a, uh, balance of Alice, balance of Bob, and the amount I want to transfer. So here I'm assuming that the um, initial uh, storage of Alice is storage index A, same for Bob. I'm deploying the token, and I'm assuming that um, 
that storage in the, at that storage location i find the initial balance so basically i'm saying that uh, in the erc20 storage uh, bob and alice have a predetermined balance uh, then i'm assuming that um, the amount which i want to send is lower than the balance and i can do the transfer i'm also assuming that their uh, addresses are different than the address of zero and then i'm pranking alice in order to uh, start the start the uh, transfer from Alice to herself or to Bob. Uh, this was a case in which I wanted to see if I can transfer to Alice the same amount of tokens, uh, transferring to herself. Uh, so yeah. Um, now we've uh, managed to integrate KVM with this uh, so Solidity type of test. Uh, KVM, as you know, is the formal implementation of the EVM semantics in the K framework. Um, it has been used um, to do large scale proving. And uh, I think a question was why we chose to, why it was chosen to uh, have the semantics of EVM and not the semantics of Solidity first. And the answer was that using the byte and using uh, the semantics of EVM, we uh, managed to call to capture bugs in the both in the Solidity compiler and in the Viper compiler, because the bytecode that was executed was failing, but the Solidity code or the Viper code uh, didn't seem to have an error, and basically there was an error of, uh, getting introduced by the compiler. Um, okay, so. Even last year or a few years ago, if we wanted to do formal verification uh, or if someone wanted to do formal verification, it had to write a K, config a K claim, which would look something like this, but only like uh, this would only be a quarter of it. So we would have to specify the initial state and the final state. We would have to specify, uh, for example, that in the status code, Initially, we do not care what status code is, but at the end, we want to have the EVMC success. This is a claim for the balance of function. Um, we would specify the program, which would be the bytecode compiled. We, we would specify all the valid jump destinations and that the output, we want to be a, value, a symbolic value val uh, padded to a 32 width. Uh, some another... Um, part of the claim. Here we're saying that the uh, ABI, that the call data that we want to call is actually the balance of function with a symbolic address owner. Uh, and what else? Another important thing is that here we're mentioning that we have a symbolic fun function for the gas and we do not want to work with concrete gas execution. Um, okay, yeah, and at the end, at the bottom of the um, configuration, we would have all the restraints on the symbolic values, saying that, okay, the account ID, the caller ID, the origin ID, and the owner would have to be in the range of addresses, and which is between zero and two to the power 160. And we would want the balance to be in the power of uh, uint 256. And here is what an account would look like in our state. We would basically have the account ID, which is the address, uh, the balance we would not care about, and the balance which we would care about is the one in the storage saying that, okay, uh, the storage of the ERC20 would have a location of owner, uh, would have a location of the mapping one and owner. One is the ID of the balances mapping in the storage layout. And that at that location, we would find the symbolic value bell, which actually at the beginning, I s expected it to be in the output cell. Basically, that's how I say that I want to return the correct value. Um, a comment um, related to my talk <laughs> yesterday, um, and now you are actually you know, emphasizing the point I was trying to make, namely that we can have sugar like K foundry right where people write specifications without even realizing the right specifications but you always have the exit solution right you can always write things like this where you have access to everything right the entire um you know configuration all the details and this is one of the you know the 
strengths, I would say, of of the K approach, which is also perceived by many as a limitation <laughs> at the same time, that yes, you have access to all this detailed information, um, and yes, it is hard to deal with it, write specifications using it. However, you know that you can always do it, okay, as opposed to inventing some ad hoc language that allows you to write some ad hoc properties a lot more elegantly, yeah. right? Fine. You like to have that, but you also want to have the exit uh, yes. strategy that you can write everything that you can or want. Uh, the idea the is that the idea that K is very powerful and uh, it's also very general. So this could be done with uh, any semantics of any given language, basically. Once you know how it, how it works and understand it, it should be pretty easy to read. But for a day-to-day -day Solidity developer, which would not really want to, yeah which would not really want to learn all of this so uh, uh here is the same claim but we're written in solidity so basically um it's the first test which we fuzzed first but with only two new additions we have our own cheat code saying that we want to use the infinite gas and we also specify that we want to have the symbolic storage for the ERC20 contract. So basically we're deploying a new contract, but instead of having uh, the empty storage, we specify that it's symbolic, it could be, it could have anything. And then again, as I said, we compute the uh, of a, an address, and I'm assuming that the um, storage so basically for any given address and any given amount, the storage of balances of address, and then I'm uh, invoking again balance of address and I'm asserting the two values. So these two are pretty similar. This one with the entire K um, claim. There are some very small differences and I'm not gonna answer and talk about them now. Um, okay, so what would a Solidity developer have to do in order to have the symbolic execution? Basically, it would have to update KVM or install KVM. And now we have a new tool called KApp in which you can both install KVM, uh, KAVM, and K and all, basically all, all of our tools using a single uh, utility. And then you will have to build and compile your uh, project using the toolkit. And in this case, as I said, we have the best integration with Forge and which is Foundry at the moment. Uh, then you would invoke the uh, Foundry compile, and here our internal Python library, what it would do is it would go to the first slide, which I said I will go back to, and it would um, intercept this API, API, ABI, and from that it will generate uh, K code and K helper modules to have to, in order to automatically generate this claim in the back end, the Solidity developer does not know about this, or does not have to look at the code. And uh, the next step would be to uh, execute the proof, and here I'm only executing a single proof. Downsides is that it takes time, so for example, only for this example, um, which is pretty simple, um, on my machine it ran on for about 10 to 12 minutes instead of some something milliseconds or a few seconds which took for concrete execution. So the best workflow would be to first write your smart contracts and then write your tests for the smart contracts and then run the concrete tests or the fast test. But then uh, if you want more assurance, uh, run them for symbolic inputs. So if your test passed, then that's great. If your tests fail, then you can join our Discord and ask questions there. Uh, but yeah, so a few benefits is that, as I said, we have symbolic execution integrated in Solidity. And we also have a debugger, which allows users to step through program execution and visualize the, gener the generated control flow graph, which is, uh, if you remember yesterday morning, what Victoria was showing like, a uh, control flow graph of your execution uh, of your smart contract. So it would look something like this, which is not ideal, especially for a Solidity user or developer. So 
in the I'm I'm sure it's not quite clear to see, but I'm just going to talk about the main windows of this. So here on the left, you have all the um, uh, a few solid a few nodes of the control for graph. So each node has a ha each node has a uh, hash and has its own um, K configuration from that point of execution. Um, and here is the K configuration, which you would have to inspect. Here you would have all the constraints at that moment. And here you would have the source map, which points back to Solidity. And here, if you see, there's a line pointing at where you are currently. So um, and this is also under active development, so it, we also add a lot of functionalities and we work constantly on it. Um, also, it has multiple features. So, for example, if I execute a proof and I end up on a node being stuck or there's a branching which I don't want to, there's a branching where it shouldn't be. Um, oh, wait, this was another idea. I'll come back to this. So, for example, uh yeah if i go to if i have uh sorry i lost myself for a bit yeah so if you would have to be on a in a situation in which the execution gets stuck then you could uh, most likely you would have to um, investigate why are you stuck at that point so basically you would in most cases you would have to write a lemma for it and then you could add your new lemma to in order to prove in order for the prover to move on. And then you will basically have to recompile, recompile everything, but the execution would still be saved. So for example, you could continue the execution for where it left off. You could basically just simplify a specific node and uh, trying to approve the lemma on that specific node. Or for example, you can just remove a node or do a node delta between two nodes and see what's the difference. So the Interactive debugger is quite powerful from that point of view. Uh, so yeah, as I said, you can simplify nodes by adding lemmas and uh, continuing the uh, execution of the proof. You can remove nodes and you have the Solidity source map integration. And uh, these are only a few. So uh, yeah, I'm not sure how's the time, do I? Okay, yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about our like vision with this project and the idea is that to make formal verification accessible for day-to-day -day users which would not have to uh, contract uh, an audit firm or a main uh, company which does formal verification to work and try on their own. It also has educational purposes and our goals for what's next is to improve the output and accessibility because uh, as i said earlier the debugger still shows k code and maybe we can find a way to have more um, readable output or we can support work on supporting multiple toolkits we can work or, on integrating this with other semantics or even with tools such as ERCX, which only handles the concrete execution um uh, yeah, and I would also like to mention our work on the uh, Multiverse X. So yeah, we did a few um, audits here for the Hatom, for the ESDT token, and I think Virgil, with, who is also here, has done work for the multi-sig wallet, wallet writing proofs. Um, yeah, so if you want to get started with the KVM integration, we have a Foundry uh, demo repository, which has information on how to get started with Foundry, with KVM, how to install it quickly. We also have a Discord community in which you can ask questions. Or if you want to ask questions now, but basically, yeah, that was my talk. Okay, thank you.